I'm pleased to introduce you to our three amazing panelists. First up is Cully Bunker. Cully is the founder and owner of Scully Effects. Kim Alpert. Kim is the founder and director of Creative Strategy at Make Amazing. And Troy Duvall, who is a reality TV producer. Yeah. So on the schedule for this uh, session, the tagline is, sometimes you've only got one minute to make your case. So make sure you don't waste it. So with that in mind, I'm going to start with Troy. So Troy, as someone who not only pitches, but also gets pitched by others, mm -hmm. what do you find works and doesn't work? Uh, the first thing is you've got to be catching me at a time that I'm not in the middle of something. Uh, <laughs> so that's small advice. Um, what works for me is something that I feel like the person who's talking to me has an emotional investment or a connection with what it is they're trying to sell me. Um, things that are presented to me sort of cynically or that are sort of like hanging on an existing trend uh, don't tend to excite me. Most of the time I don't take pitches um, because you know I'm very rarely in a, in a position with a company where that's required of me, but as I'm moving into you know, my own shingle here in the next year, uh, I'm going to be doing a lot more of that. And what I want to really hear is that you're invested in that project and that the project is actually workable and viable. I think that's the mistake a lot of people make. They'll bring in uh, a project that's either going to cost, there's going to be a cost in practicality or a casting in practicality, or there is no network um, that the project would ever actually be tailored for. So I just want to know that you thought about it. So reality, like no reality to talk about reality. Exactly. I love that. I want to kind of just jump off that for a second because we like I hadn't really thought until like this exact moment about when people pitch to me because I like that's just I pitch so much in advertising mm -hmm. and that's one of those things that is it's so I like I spent so much time kind of thinking about this but not that part and knowing who you're talking to is yeah, so God, so critical and the number one thing that happens to me and it happens to me probably, oh, I don't know, like a very high percentage, is that someone will explain something to me in a manner that they clearly have not done any research to what I have done and what I could potentially know. Mm -hmm. And they explain something that's fairly technical, maybe considered complicated, um, but in a way that like it's going to be really hard for me to understand it. And <laughs> it's something that like I have done like years ago. And I'll be like, OK, yes. Okay, and clearly I'm giving them signs of like, let's get through this. Like I code in five languages, like I've set up many networks and servers as a young lady. Like let's get to the meat of this. Um, that's a really important one. I think when you have a limited amount of time with somebody being able to know like what, what they can already put, fill in the blanks mm -hmm. for you. Yeah, I, I find it kind of the same. It, it investigate the person that you're going to be uh, you're going to be interacting with, uh, see what their background is, uh, so you have an, at least a personal knowledge of, of them before you before you put yourself in the situation to, to be actually speaking with them, if it's possible, if there's that information you can get to. That way you, 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 you may be able to make a personal connection uh, before they even know it. So I want to throw the second question to Kim to get it started. Kim, why do, why do our students need an elevator pitch? Well, a, a student, I mean, everybody kind of needs an elevator pitch, depending on if they're pitching themselves or they're pitching an idea. Um, definitely, as a student, you want to be able to pitch yourself really well because you're going to meet someone, like maybe today, one of us, or at, be at some point, like some place where you meet somebody, and you know, it's not necessarily someone you're interviewing with. You don't have them in like a controlled environment, like guaranteed amount of time. So you want to be able to say very quickly, "This is what I do." This is what I care about. This is what I'm looking to do. Mm -hmm. And then be able to answer the why by after you get their interest. Let, like, let that first piece, like, give them the lure and then keep the line. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times I'll have somebody, like, right away I'll be like, yes, what you just said. Get, and then they just keep talking. And then by the time they're done talking, I'm like, I got to get out of here. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, they, we've, they, it lost kind of somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I think that's well, tr try that's to gauge try to gauge the uh, their engagement to you, and if you see them losing it, you may want to just back off yeah. and try again some other time because you may just annoy them if you go too far too fast. Yeah. Uh, if it's something that you, I mean, it, an elevator pitch, it, it depends on when it comes in too. If it's a scheduled meeting, that's one thing. But if it's a chance a uh, chance meeting by accident, there's so many different levels of this. Um, you know, there's the slow. The slow roll elevator pitch where you get to be friends with somebody over time and uh, there's the fast thing when you're actually in an elevator and you're like, who's this person? Why, why, what, can, what can they, you want to you go after, uh, after it, like I know they can do something for me, but I don't want to act like I'm trying to do that. Yeah. And I, I used to do, I'm, I'm going to just jump back in. When I, so I worked at Leo Burnett when I was young, when I was like 20. And I, it's a humongous building, many, many floors. And I would literally be on the elevator. And I worked as like a VTR tech, like in the core, doing archival stuff and video stuff. And I wanted to be in big creative, you know, when I was young, a young lady. So I, I'd be in the elevator and I'd overhear conversations and sometimes jump in and be like, oh, did you say blah, blah, blah? And they, they would be like, who are you? You need to be able to answer who are you real quickly when you get the chance to actually have somebody interested. That's um, an awesome opportunity to get into. It is, but there's also a tendency that I find, especially with people who are very new, that they're so excited to tell you who they are that they're going to oversell themselves. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I immediately go to that place in my mind that plays the first minute and a half of Ludacris's Get Back video. <laughs> 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 and that's who you feel like you're talking to, is the person who's overselling themselves for the project or the project or telling you something in a way that they can't, po that, like that information can't possibly be correct. Yeah. You know, and you're selling yourself as you're you're worldwide, and you're the great, you're the greatest, and you're this, and you're that. It's like I, I know you're you're not, but you know, give me some reason to believe that you are who you are at the level that you're at. Yeah. And people love to give each other breaks more than you think in this business. Under promise, over deliver. Under promise, over deliver. And it's yeah. not a bad thing to just be beginning, or to be like. It isn't. It's small. not like. To be a big deal in a really small way right. to like your friends and your family, and have done like a little thing that you're proud of. That's like awesome. Like you don't There's have no to be like the biggest rapper in the game. Like you can just right. be like, you like phoniness young. Is, like phoniness that's real. Is much worse than inexperience. Yeah. So, so uh, it, it, that kind of leads us to the next question, Kelly. You feel free to jump in here and start with us. What so what differentiates a professional pitch from an amateur one? I actually wouldn't. <laughs> it's it's not really my area. The pitch. Um, uh, being the business I'm, at, I'm in, I'm really not in a position to go pitch a lot of the time. I'm in a position to try to explain my opinion on something that somebody may want, uh, which is kind of a pitch, but it's not really like, hey, this is what I can do for you. Uh, give me a job. Um, I don't find myself in those situations a lot, but if I do, it's a very slow roll up. Like I'll meet somebody that can possibly put me in a position to do work for them, but I don't want to jump right in on it. Uh, I, I actually, uh, what I'm calling the slow, the very, the escalator pitch. I get to, the, <laughs> I get to, I get to um, uh, try to meet these people and over time develop a personal relationship before I'll go uh, for any kind of monetary gain. Because uh, in my business in LA, there's just everybody's in the business. And my kid goes to an elementary school with producers of huge movies. And I meet all these people, and instantly I want to go, I want to work on your stuff. And that's just bad form. So I've actually been spending years developing relationships just with my kids, friends, mom and dads. Uh, so there's, there's, there's just so many different ways to go about it. You just have to gauge it. Like if you have one minute with a person, that's, 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 that's tough. I, I'm really, I'm, I don't think I'm very good at that part, but uh, the slow relationship uh, escalator pitch is, is more my role. Um, and I'm professional or not, uh, I just, you just have to develop a personality for it and, and slowly gauge the person and make sure they're engaged with you. Uh, I've found, so Gary Jones has taught me something that um, I've, I've, I've just fascinated with him. He is one of the only people that I can, when he's talking to you, he listens to you and it's all about you. Most people, when they look at you, um, you're thinking, what can I say next? He's just wanting to hear what you have to say. That is a huge skill if you can develop it that will follow you for the rest of your life. Like, there should be a class on that. That's a Jedi master. Though. It is. 
It right. really is. Like, it's awesome. E- e- even when he's doing it, I'm still thinking, mm-hmm. what can I say to Gary next? Instead of what he's t- talking about. And I'm thinking, this is exactly what I'm want- doing wrong. <laughs> so if you can learn how to be a Jedi Gary master, that will help uh, you in the future. Just really honestly be engaged in listening and, and being able to respond to what, they, what people say. It's just, it's huge. And... I've learned a lot just listening to Gary. Well, piggybacking off of that, when you talk about listening, I would I would rather be asked for input or advice all day long as opposed to being asked for opportunity all day long. Mm-hmm. People don't have an infinite resource for giving you that break or that in. But if somebody comes up and says, "Listen, like what? I, I like what you do. I'd like to do what you do. Like, what's the start point? Like, what's the first job?" I'll talk to you for as long as I have spare time to tell you how to move ahead and how to advance yourself. If you come up to me and say, hey, I would love to work on one of your shows. I don't know you from Adam. Um, and if you want to pitch me or sell me something, I, I don't know what value you bring to the project. I don't have anything there. Like The time to ask me is not when you first meet me. Get me invested in who you are. And then probably the third or fourth time we exchange emails or a phone call, you say, hey, I have this thing. Is there anybody you think I could bring it to? or where do you think is a good home for this, or how might I tailor this for such and such an executive, on a very rare opportunity, maybe one out of 100, I'll say, well, I know an exec who's looking for that exact thing, and then I'll bounce you over to that person who's actually buying. So if you ask me for the opportunity, I don't own a production company. I, I, like, I don't physically have the means to produce anything that you bring to me. You know? So if you ask me about, if you, if you try to pitch me, or you want to sell me a show, I don't have an answer for you. If you want to ask me how to put something together, and then six months from now when you actually have it together, and I know somebody who's looking for a particular thing, I'll put you in touch then. Is your, you know, the, the pitch is largely for yourself, and it's largely sort of surreptitiously. It's, it's to engage that person to a point where there might be an ongoing dialogue later, and then you can ask a favor maybe you know, f- the fourth time you see them. Yeah. You know? Don't- don't limit the future by trying to devour the now. Exactly. Ooh. You know, that's a really... You guys I like see that? a refrigerator oh. magnet. Oh, it's good, right? <laughs> that, is that was the Jedi pitch move. That I just made that up. Exactly. Sweet. You know, but that's, that's totally... I see that stuff happen all the time. Yeah. I, think, um, I think for me, some of like the like noob moves that I see in pitching a lot, because I, in, in our time, I mean, I've... I'm constantly like doing upfronts and pitching and with other agencies and one agency pitching to another agency with clients. Um, know what you're going to say and know what you're going to show and like rehearse. You're performing. Like that's, there was a moment in time when I, I was probably six or seven years into my career. I'd been a creative director for a little while. I'd won some pitches. I'd done some pitches that kind of didn't go so great, but like maybe we did a little project instead of the big one we were talking about. Um, lost some pitches where I was like, but that went great, what happened? Um, and I was like, I want to be better. And I actually went and I, I took a stand-up class um, with an amazing comedian. She was, she's incredible. And uh, you know, and I was like, well, this is going to help me be better at pitching. It actually made me love doing a little bit of stand-up, too. And one of the best pieces of advice she ever gave me, um, she said, think about what you're going to say. Say with the smallest amount of words possible. Mm-hmm. And there are still moments, I mean, that's, it's probably been, I don't know, six or seven years or something like that since I took that class. And I'll be writing an email, and I'll be like, this could get confusing, or this is somebody who's really important to me. And I'll hear her, and I'll be like, okay, use the smallest amount of words, because mm-hmm. there's less room for interpretation. And um, I think that's, that's one of the biggest things. And if you're presenting with a visual aid, don't read the screen. Talk to the person. That's something when I'm in a pitch, and somebody's got four bullet points and they're reading me those four bullet points, they literally are wasting my time because that is something I could have read. Mm-hmm. I want to talk about there. That's not, we're here to talk about the meat. Don't just show me this. Like that's, you know, that's not doing the same. And people critique my pitches all the time and they're like, Kim, you have like four slides, but this, this meeting is 90 minutes. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> you know, like there's a lot, I have a lot to say about those things. And when I was starting to kind of create that method for me, I would literally write, like almost script what I was going to write with each mm-hmm. slide, like underneath them in the notes area, or I'd have one version that was my presentation version, and then a version that had like paragraphs that was like hideous, and that was my like performance version that I practiced on. Um, but that's, you know, there's no, 
there's no shame in that game. Like pitching is really hard, mm -hmm. you know. And if you're if you're creative by nature, like the most painful, horrible thing you ever have to do is like get up and speak in front of people, or you know, go and feel like you might be facing reject. Like rejection's the worst, mm -hmm. but it's you know, it's never the fault of the you. It's not you as a person. It's the moment, right? You know, and there's always there's good or bad. So how has pitching, I'll start with you, Troy, how has pitching helped you in your career? Um, well, it's, I used to have a major problem with word efficiency. <laughs> uh, I'm still struggling with it. It's uh, taken me a while, and I'll stop talking about it now. Um, <laughs> pitching really, uh, I think that we're sort of afraid when we start to share an idea that if we don't share all of it, that we've failed. Um, and what I've learned from pitching is there's a woman named Ellen Sandler that is part of a group that I lecture with called the TV Writers Summit. We go all over the place and we lecture about TV production. And she worked on Everybody Loves Raymond and she says, do you know what Everybody Loves Raymond is about? And I said, well, yeah, it's this guy that's married to blah, blah, blah. And she says, no, it's about uh, affection and food and what we do not to interrupt the flow of either. That's every single episode of Raymond is got something to do where if I screw this up, then I don't get to have sex anymore. If I screw this up, then mom's not going to bring the lasagna over or I'm not going to eat well or whatever. Um, and that was basically the, that was basically how you describe Everybody Loves Raymond to someone who's never seen it before. And it's just you try to figure out the most efficient way to get those things out. But I've also noticed that it's helped me that learning to engage people is more important than getting the idea out because if they're engaged, I've had a lot of pitch meetings where I'm supposed to come in for 15 minutes and sit down with a development executive and I say, here's this game show that I think is right for you guys because I've seen these two other game shows that you've done. This seems right up your wheelhouse. I know you have a relationship with this network. This particular executive already knows me from somewhere else if you take this to them. In just that brief period of time, they know that I'm viable, that I already have connections, that I've worked on other shows, and that this is an idea that I've put enough thought into that it belongs to them. What happens at that point is it transforms from... Uh, Sorry, guys. That's okay. <laughs> um, it transforms from a pitch into a conversation. And the deal is always to get to the conversation because the conversation will keep you there for an hour and a half or two hours or whenever they have to leave for lunch and sometimes you get to come with. Mm -hmm. Um, that's what you want. The other thing about the pitch uh, is the pitch is not necessarily about, if you're talking about television as a project, the pitch is not about whatever you've brought in that day. The pitch is about you. And what ends up happening is, is they say, I had a good time with this person in my office, so the next time they have something, come back anytime and talk to me about it. Let me know when you have something else. They might even start doing things like tipping you off, like I have a major network that calls me and says, listen, we're really looking for some big shiny floor game shows right now, which is what they call this, their affectionate title is the shiny floor game show for any game show that takes place in a studio. Um, so then my mind can go in that direction and I have a better chance of selling them something because I know what the head of that network is looking for at that particular time and I'm bringing them things that are tailored to what they want and I can start creating specifically for them. Um, again, just get to the conversation. Don't worry so much about, you know, getting every piece of information out that you have memorized about your show. It's about developing a relationship with those execs. Yeah, I mean, to that to that point, when I saw some of like the most savant, incredible pitches that I've ever seen, I've been in the room with like executive creative directors that just like slay clients, that just like are winning like billion dollar business. They ask questions and they react in the room. And I remember when I was like, had like an aha moment, I was like, oh my God. And that's, to turn that around, it's a very difficult thing to do. So I don't, you shouldn't be like, so how was breakfast? Like, it has to be like a relevant <laughs> question that like kind of works. Um, but it just, it changes the whole dynamic of the room. Cause yeah. then all of a sudden everybody's engaged and they can change, cause the need state, you know, I, I mind are all gonna be kind of advertising lately, like the need state of where the client is and what they think they want might not be right. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times you're going in and you're pitching work that's based on a brief that may not have adequate research or knowledge or experience to really even be the right brief to do the right work that is actually the thing that's gonna change their business right. and do what the, the outcome that they're looking for is. So being able to kind of unearth some of that and be amorphous in the, in the pitch itself 
it separates you. And you know, a lot of times when we go in and pitch, it's usually you know three agencies will go up, and there's there's a rhythm and a dance to it that kind of has to happen and find that flow of you know maybe you you know your your team will talk for 20 or 30 minutes, you know put in a break, stop, go slow. Um, I watched a great creative director pitch recently who's um, South American man, he's very animated, and he'll be very animated and be talking about an idea, and then all of a sudden he'd put up a slide and it was just say, stop. And I was like, that's so great. Like, and he's just, he's a very quirky guy and that really fit his personality. And you know, he was pitching, there was probably I think close to 40 people in the room, like a really big brand team and four or five different agency teams as well. Um, so, so I mean, a lot's on the stake. It's his ideas that he's presenting from his team. And um, it just really, it made it fun and whimsical and allowed us time to digest right. and like really think about what he said. And uh, it was really cool, you know, Whatever your convention is that you feel comfortable with, it's not like, you know, here's the pitch box, you gotta fit in it. You know, be comfortable with what you're doing and I think everything just goes a lot easier. Yeah. Okay, so give us an example of a distinctive approach that worked for you and opened the door to a follow-up meeting. I can tell you that I remember everybody. Um, and for me, the approach is always the person that you're connected with, the mutual acquaintance that you have with the person that's there. If you don't have a mutual acquaintance somewhere, and I certainly wouldn't recommend it earlier in your career because I think a lot of people that come out of film school, the first thing they want to do is try to pitch an original project. And I always say, go work on things for a couple years before you pitch. It took me eight years to get my first pitch meeting. But when I did, it was with people that I knew who I had come up with who had leapfrogged over me and were now in executive positions at networks. Um, but an approach that worked for me, um, I recently uh, had a pitch where I did a show called Hollywood Game Night, and all four of the executives in the room are people who have either been executives on shows that I've worked, uh, the, where I worked with them before they became execs, uh, and I would call people that were connected to them and say, I'd like to set a meeting with so-and-so, you know, I'm a, I'm a friend of his, we had worked together on such and such a show. That got me in the door. But what really worked was I had really kept up with everybody as far as the projects that they'd worked on before, the stuff they had in development. And a lot of it, when I came in, I was like, you know, I heard that you had sold X, Y, and Z. Like, you've got three shows on the air right now. I'm like, did you ever think that that would happen for you? No, I mean, it's really amazing. We love this opportunity. And you kind of, as soon as you can get around the exact facade that people feel like they have to put up in, in meetings, they're engaged. That got me, uh, I didn't make a sale there, but it got me a regular invite to go back and pitch at a network level pretty much any time I want to, and not being a production company, that very rarely happens. Most of the time, if I'm gonna go to a network, I have to go someplace like Authentic that has a relationship with Bravo and say, I have an idea for a show for Bravo, would you guys partner with me and then we'll take it to Bravo. But that's, not, that's kind of an obtuse example. But if you knew how little I'd slept in the last two days, <laughs> this would sound completely genius, I promise you. I thought it was good. All right. Yeah, I liked it. I bought At it. least once every time I speak on a panel, I apologize for how I'm speaking. <laughs> it's just kind of a My advice is to trade. not apologize lose. for yourself. Just, I'm not sorry. OK, good. <laughs> um, I think it's really similar. I go, I'll go into a pitch now, and sometimes I'll know somebody that's in the room, and like that's such a like incredible. Like you just are like, oh, this is gonna be a little easier. Yeah. Like they know what kind of crazy they're gonna get today, because this is what you're getting. Do you pitch um, in that voice? Sometimes. That's awesome. Sometimes I do my like crazy scared lady voice. So we have ideas we'd like to show, <laughs> and then I like just, then I laugh at myself and go into it. Um, I'll talk about. I have like a like a really like a crazy, awesome pitch moment kind of thing. That was the question, right? Yeah. Okay, close enough. Um, this is actually, I mean, it's not like a, a really pitch pitch, but like this was an interview, which is kind of like a pitch in a lot, like pitching yourself. Um, and this was like a meeting. It wasn't quite, we didn't know it was going to be like an interview for a job. It was just kind of like, I'm going to meet with this really awesome person, and maybe we'll see if they think I, I am too. And uh, I walked around the office, and. Um, I was meeting with Matt Brannick, who's an incredible executive creative director who's, who's not with us anymore. And uh, 
they had posters all over the office that just said, you're dead a long time. And I was really struck by it. And I was like, this is a real weird thing to have all over this office. <laughs> and um, when I first sat down, he was like, uh, well, how, what's going on? And I go, who put all those posters up, first thing, before we even got in talking about me? And he goes, I did. And I was like, oh, okay. So then I just like cataloged that, like, all right, this guy's a little weird, nuts, like, just check. And uh, we talked, and like we talked about experience, and like how he run, he ran the company there, and, and some of my creative experience and stuff. And then I noticed that we were both kind of like sitting back in our chairs, and then we were both wearing jeans and loafers. Mm -hmm. and neither one of us was wearing socks. And, and we were both like sitting with our foot on our knee, so it was like real apparent that neither of us was wearing socks. And I, I waited until we were kind of done talking, and he goes, "So what do you think?" And I was like, "I think we." We shop at the same sock store. And I said it just <laughs> like that. And he was like really expecting, like I was being very, very technical and like very buttoned up. And then I just kind of led with that. And we just had like such a laugh. And um, when he emailed me back, he was just like, you're fucking great. Like just like dropping F-bombs like right out the gate. I was like, what? <laughs> like, okay, like clearly that, like that must have been a little memorable. But that's, you know. Are I we think on a five second delay? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, nobody warned me. Yeah. Nobody warned There's me. There's no so. cough box on this. I don't know. We had a, yeah, so that's, I mean, that's one of those things, if you can make it personal, if you can be yeah. in the moment, and it's so hard to be in the moment, to be like right in the now with folks, um, you can make something really, really memorable. And that's the biggest thing about the elevator pitch is to make it memorable, you know, and that's what you want is for them to call you, to email you, to remember, you know, so when you see them a year from now, two years from now, they're like, oh yeah, you're that person. I met a young lady here a couple of years ago, um, Benita, who's like such a sweet, sweet girl. And like we met, I was touring campus and um, she knew I really like bananas. She liked some banana stuff in her work. And then she reached out to me online and was like, it's me with a banana. And I was like, yes, like I totally remember you. And we met for like a second. Yeah. And um, we've shared- Is that Benita Chen? Yeah, yes. She's awesome. Isn't she great? <laughs> I know, she's so sweet. And the banana and, um, thing you remember. Yeah. I know, yeah. And I was like, yeah, she remembered, I remember. And it's one of those things like that, that elevator pitch from her, like that moment she was able to like, capture and like do that Gary like that Jedi move where like you create silence around you and it's just that conversation mm -hmm. that's there well these guys are in a totally different area of, of the industry than I am so I, I don't have to go quite through this uh, I, I end up having uh, we get a call like hey we want you to work on this what have you done lately so we have the uh, a bunch of our work online that we can say okay what do they want and we tailor uh, an email basically that links to all these uh, recent projects that are relevant to what they want. So we send it to them and uh, they look at it and say, well, we like your work, um, what can we do from here? And then I, I don't, I, usually me selling is just going, okay, so you wanna blow something up? Here's some explosions, what do you think? We can do that for you. Uh, or you wanna look a lot more fabulous? Well, here's what we did for blah, blah, blah. And we can do that for you. And, Sometimes that just sells itself. So I'm, I'm in a little different league than these guys. I don't have to sell as hard. Um, I've been established for a while and the people just, they, they call me up and then I have to try to show them what I've done before and have that readily available and then just try to make it personal somehow and sell myself <coughs> with confidence. Like, we can do that. And then uh, back it up. So, how can our students make their personal brand come to life when they're pitching either an elevator, uh, elevator pitch or just a project that they have? <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> you have a personality. Uh, don't be the formal version of yourself in a room. Mm -hmm. I think what, what Kim is telling you, the people that I've always remembered are people that are super dynamic. A um, couple case studies as far as, as whenever you get an actual pitch. Um, Tom Lennon and Ben Garrett, who did Night at the Museum, uh, did Reno 911. They're now uh, executive producers of At Midnight on Comedy Central. Those guys, whenever they pitched, they were matching black suits, which is a very rare thing <laughs> anymore. Like the suit is sort of slowly dying in Hollywood. Um, but they do th little things to be memorable. Um, there are people I know that are very passionate. <coughs> if you've ever watched Quentin Tarantino talk to anybody about a story, uh, where he's trying to tell you something, get this is usually the first thing he says, which is kind of like, I'm gonna talk to you about this like you're a cool film nerd like I am. 
I'm convinced that that's a major component of his success is basically because he talks about everything in a way that he's very passionate about what he's doing and that it's evident. Let yourself come through in what it is you're presenting as opposed to coming into the room, like I said earlier, with a sort of cynically created uh, something that you're not really into. If I went in and was like, I have a cooking show for moms in a hurry, flat lines I mean, <laughs> because you can tell from looking at me usually I'll have like the crazy jacket on or something fun when I go to a pitch and uh, they're not expecting me to give them something like that they're expecting to be engaged um, so have a have a personality be yourself if you're not super outspoken it's fine but always remember you know in a pitch you're trying to get to a conversation and to get to a conversation you have to be somebody that people want to have a conversation with mm -hmm. so the person you are is enough there is no imaginary type that you have to be to sell anything yeah have your personality yeah i think is important like you know because i like bananas or i like comedy or whatever i like you don't have to like what i like to be the person that's pitching to me and have it go well and be awesome and me think like you're amazing like you can be like an all camo wearing like hardcore hunter dude who's like wicked like conservative and thinks i'm totally bananas and weird and should get a different haircut you like that's cool like you can have those opinions and come and just be really into what you're into and I'm gonna get excited about what you're into because that's like you're owning your stuff and you're cool like cool because you're passionate about it mm -hmm. and that's who you are and I think you know oftentimes the you know when you're kind of first starting out and you're a student and you've got your identity you're like uh, this is what you know this is what a computer programmer looks like and you're like here's your black t-shirt here's your jeans and here's your you know, skinny puppy tapes or whatever if you're not in stuff that <laughs> hardcore. I don't know. Um, like, like, or you're a designer, so you must wear the, the clear glasses or be like really, you know, this person. And there, there really isn't a mold, you know. I, it's, I think the saving grace of like the hilarious phrase, like the bro grammar, is that at least it like mixed up some of the stereotypes yeah. and like the interactive industry, regardless of my feelings on bro grammars. Um, but you know, that's, be into whatever you're into. If you're like into cats, like be like super into lol. I like saw a resume once that was like, I've made over a thousand lol cats was like in the notes. And I was like, I don't know if I would put that on there, but that's hilarious. Like that's a bizarre thing to like own. Um, yeah, I don't, it was, it was weird, but yeah, own the stuff that you're into and like be into it and not, you know, be unabashedly like yourself. And I think people really, they respond to that. And I don't think you need to feel insecure about who you are. You're, you're made up of all of your memories that you've had, which is why you're that way. Mm -hmm. And I'm made up of all of my memories, which is why I turned out this way. So there's no, there's no right mold for how like any role is supposed to fit. There's no like, oh, you're, you're definitely like, you're a creative director guy. Like, oh, you're a visual effects guy. Like there's, there's no way, like there's just, you can't peg people like that. And mm -hmm. well, it's just being confident in yourself, being comfortable in your own shoes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, can't say that enough. Yeah, and don't and don't make it so stakesy for yourself when you go into pitch. You're going to pitch a lot. You're going to get rejected a lot. There are going to be people who don't click with you a lot. Um, if you go in and you think I've got to sell this, I've got to sell this. Like I really want to sell this. If I don't sell this today, this is going to suck. If I if I don't sell, you can read that on people. And desperation has a very real sort of scent. Like you can really tell when someone feels oh like I gotta, I gotta sell this. You're not yourself. You're not listening to the other person. You're you're controlling the conversation instead of remembering to ask questions and just be part of an experience with another human being. Every pitch you have, even when it sucks, is something that you learn from because you learn how people reacted to you. You catalog that. You move on. The next time you go in, you're like, eh, maybe I won't do that next time. Mm -hmm. I love that, that scene in American Beauty where she's like preparing the house to yeah. sell that house. Oh. Sometimes if we have like really big meetings or I have somebody that, like a friend that's interviewing, I'll send them that clip right. because she's so crazy. I'm going to sell that house today. Like, cause it's just such an intense, like such a level of intensity <laughs> that's like unnecessary. Um, or I'll put like Rocky music on or something. Yeah. Cause you just kind of need to laugh at yourself. Like if it's, cause it, it, it feels, it's, it is high stakes, you know? But, you know, enjoy, enjoy the silliness of it, you know? I listen to Joe Esposito's You're the Best in the car on the way to pitch meetings. I love that. Sometimes it helps. That's awesome. Do you have pitch? Do you have, like, special music, like, meeting music? It, it's just really not my forte. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just not a, 
Uh, I'm not a traditional pitcher. I depend. I have some. It depends on the meeting. I have like I have like genre specific kind of That's songs. <laughs> well, so I'm glad you mentioned that because should our students have more than one elevator pitch? Should they have a multitude God. of pitches? Always have three things when you go in a room. Always because be pitching. When somebody says, when somebody says, <laughs> ABC, always be <laughs> ca ca pitching. Um, whenever I go into a meeting, the, the, the worst thing that can happen is you go in, you say the idea, and they're like, nope. And then it's sort of like, <laughs> I like your desk. It's pretty. Um, if you have a couple of other things, uh, I have a thing that I call the brick, and I talk about it at Full Sail a lot, is every idea that I've ever had for a show that was ever pitched or turned down exists in a hard copy format in a book about this big. And the brick is for whenever I go in to meetings, I will thumb through the brick before I come to the meeting and just be like, okay, okay I remember, okay, well, I have the mother-in-law, okay, I've got, I've got this, I've got this, I've got this, okay, they're doing this, this new executive's like this, da, 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 okay. I'll go into the meeting, I'll pitch the first thing, and they'll say, well, we're kind of going in this direction where we want to do, we've got a Mother's Day week, and we want to program for that next year, so we'd love to do like a one-off thing about mothers, and I'd be like, oh, I said, I have a, I have a show about mother-in-laws and how you know, they relate to the family and sort of the, how they've been stigmatized and blah, 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 blah. And it's really kind of funny and very tongue-in-cheek, which sounds like what it is you want. If that's not, I mean, if I can pitch that for you and I can send you the, you know, I can send you a treatment later, whatever. And they're always kind of surprised that there's always something else that they want because the, when you talk to them and they, they, they'll, t people will tell you what they want, but they usually want to know that you've tried to figure it out. And again, that's why I say it's, you get to the conversation you find out what they're really looking for, and if you have something else ready, if you have more than one pitch, if you haven't put all your eggs in the basket where you're going to do like the action show where people beat each other in the face with skillets until one person passes out, if you have something else, then you can continue the conversation. And the longer you can continue the conversation, the more memorable you are and the greater the chance of you getting into that room again and or selling something. I am not pitching a show about people beating each other in the face with skillets. I, I was totally just like still thinking about that. <laughs> I and he was like, now. we're in the spatula space right now. <laughs> so if you have anything with spatulas. I still have, I mean, I'm not, clearly not a student. I have multiple self pitches because I do multiple things. So, you know, like I, I have a very, um, you know, I have a, a lot of work in the fine art space. And a lot of times while I'm out as an artist and I'm showing work or I'm at a, at an opening or I'm talking about that inherently because there are people that have jobs or businesses or friends or whatever, family, whatever, my marketing work will come up. So then all of a sudden like Kim Alpert, video sculptor, it has to talk about Kim Alpert, strategist. And I have to be able to navigate between the two, which is really, really difficult. And I, I can't stress enough that like, I'm, I'm in the midst of this like big personal identity project right now because it's, it's such an ever evolving thing, you know, and don't feel like, you know, if you're, if this is who you are now, you have to all, you're going to live as that forever. Let it be, you know, when I first graduated, I, you know, I had cards to like digital media specialist. <laughs> what the hell is that? You know, like that's, I was an animator and I was an interactive producer and I've been a programmer and a designer and a creative director. I've had so many different titles through the years that it's one of those things that I've had to kind of amorphously create you know, my elevator pitch is totally dependent on like where I am and what they want to talk about that is relevant to them. So still, you know, cause, and also in my, you know, my kind of like day, day job life, if I'm with advertising folks, like they're also humans that have interest in art or music or technology and they're gonna wanna talk about the other stuff too. So I'm a big proponent of just, you know, one life and talking about all the facets of your life in a way that's very easy to understand for people. And um, if it, even if it may be something that's hard to grasp for them, if it makes really good sense to you, um, they'll fill in the blanks and figure it out, you know? And it, you know, if, it's, if you are happy and passionate and interested and they're like, oh, okay, or make it relatable in a way that is something that they can very easily reference in culture, um, that's always very helpful. I've actually found that I, I'm selling, selling or pitching more within a job than actually yeah. trying to get the job. Um, to try to uh, balance uh, the company's uh, financials and delivery dates, uh, I actually have to sell or convince 
the client that this is good enough or you don't want to go down this road, you want to go down this road, and sometimes it's hard because I know this isn't the best quality road, but to get their job done and on time and in budget, I have to sell them on something they may not like, which is re is is the really the most hardest one of the most hardest things to do is because this is this person's dream at this time they're really emotionally involved, and I have to kind of cut them off at the legs and sell them like, yeah, you we all want this, but uh, to for us all to survive, you have to take this, and uh, that that also becomes a skill as well. I think that's harder. It's very hard. To be honest, like that's you're like navigating, you're like already in the boat navigating like water, like and you guys are over there. Yeah, you know, we're just like give us this boat. Like when you're the <laughs> beginning pitch is like, let's get a boat. Yeah, we have all these it's big totally, dreams at the beginning so of the job, hard. but halfway in the between mm -hmm. the job it's like, okay, we can either go with what you really want or we have to go down this road, which is it's almost as good, but you know, it's not gonna. It, we're not gonna float at the end of this if we don't if we don't cut some corners. And uh, and then sometimes in the middle of a job, they want to see a bunch of examples. And you you always fall in love with one, and you try to sell that. And I have to tell you, most of the time they never go with my first love. So that's also something you have to let go of too. It's like I really want this one, <laughs> but uh, the client's like, no, I don't like all three. Try something else. Yeah. We do this, like, we, that's very similar, like, in advertising. Never you know, fall in love with one idea. Your recommend, they'll be like, which one is your recommendation? And, like, you all, like, everybody will sit and talk, like, which one's our record? Like, beforehand, you'll figure it out. And, um, and you, you try, just because and you, you like you pray. it, yeah, they don't want that <laughs> that's going to be what they want. And then, inevitably, it's always, like, usually, not always, but it's gonna, like a Frankenstein of, like, can we get this from one and this from two and some of three and pepper them all together? And I'd love to do a job where money was no object and it's like, Money's no object. Go with whatever is the most best of everything. It never <laughs> happened yet. So, <laughs> so this is uh, for a lot of our students who are just kind of starting out. Maybe this is their first month, or they, you know, they're new to this game here. But how can our students sell themselves with confidence when it's when maybe it's not in their nature? Oh man, I mean, you got to learn how to talk to people. Yeah. You know, no matter what you do, like whether you're the mailman. Or the business owner, or like a full it's, sale lab instructor. I mean, like you just have to be able to talk to people well. Cool. And it's you know go out, go to a place, go meet strangers, go to like meetup.com. Like if you can't talk about your work because you're too green or you, it's like too personal or it's your art or you know find a way. You know maybe it's a, a movie meetup where you're just gonna go talk about movies that you like or. <laughs> You know, I mean, no, I just, like, no, don't no, no, giggle no, at me. A, I had something in my head. I'm like, <laughs> what's what's that uh, uh, chat roulette? Pitch people on chat roulette. Yeah, just dial it up and say, who are you? I'm going to sell you this idea. That is <laughs> not going to go the way is, you think. I, not usually. There's usually uh, Different appendages. Different kind of pitch. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> exactly. um, it's a, it's a, just a random idea that popped into yeah. my head. <laughs> and well, I'm practiced with friends, too, you know, or teachers. We, yeah. I don't know if they still do that here. Actually, I was just moving some stuff around in my studio and I found my VHS tape of my mock interview and I watched it and it's like me at like 19 and I'm like, I'm like totally like slouched back in this chair. Like, yeah, this is what I do. I was like, oh my God, this is <laughs> brutal. Um, and I'm sure I felt somewhat the same when I watched it then. And I was like, this is really, really smart. And they videotaped me going through this whole mock interview. Body language, yeah. Body yeah. language. We didn't even straight, talk about that. Don't That's a fidget, too. Fidget, fidget, yeah. fidget, fidget, if you yeah. can. Yeah. And if you can't do confidence, do earnestness. Mm. Yeah. Because if, if people know that you're being very genuine about who you are, that just goes so incredibly far. And, you know, I, I cop to the areas that I don't know. Now, at 45, with 300 hours of TV behind me, I'll still say, I'm not entirely sure how such and such a process works, but I'm a big fan of these types of shows, got an idea for this, blah, 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 blah. Um, and people, people trust you if you're, if you're honest with them. Don't feel like there's any sense of bravado that has to accompany you know, bravado is not the same thing as confidence. There are a lot of people that have no confidence at all who have bravado coming out of the wazoo. I've had artists come in and uh, they, they weren't the greatest artists starting, <coughs> and, but I saw how hard they wanted it and how hard they wanted to try, and mm -hmm. you know, they developed themselves over time, and I gave them that opportunity because I just saw how honest and hardworking they wanted to be at it. Uh, and they, you know, sometimes being the best isn't good enough. 
Mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to be, you know, the personality is really comes through in, in, in the uh, work ethic and the, um, the will to want to succeed. Yeah. yeah, be honest if even, you're having... Even if you're too shy sorry. to do it. Okay. I totally thought you were done. Yeah, I wasn't done. <laughs> I, was, I paused. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. Don't interrupt. That was horrible. Um, no, I forgot what I was going to say because I felt so bad. Mm-hmm. Gosh darn it. Don't interrupt people because this is what could happen to yeah, you. Yeah, and then you forget what you're going to say, and you're like, good gravy. Uh, was it about me being great? No. Oh, you know what? It was. It was. You, you sparked something, then I was like, it's going to fall out of your brain. Oh, I mean, it, you guys are really great. I mean, this is the kind of like the best panel sandwich ever. Panel sandwich. Um, it was being really honest. You know, I, I meet with young folks all the time, and like, if you're really nervous, you're having a hard time, like, just say <laughs> Sorry. it. Sorry. No, go ahead. She's coming up with gold, like every other word. Panel sandwich. <laughs> Panel sandwich. How is that just? Pale burgers. <sighs> um, really grilled cheese with my yellow coat. Yeah, um, copyright 2015. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're, yeah, if you're, I'll be We have to wrap this up. We're right going to have to wrap it up. I keep looking at the giant clock right, that you guys can't see. All right, vodka. No. <laughs> um, Say you're having a really hard time. Like I've been interviewing like younger folks, like like interns and stuff, and they've been super sweaty and like shaky, and I can tell like this is their first interview. <laughs> yeah. And they'll be like, I'm having a really hard time. And when they have that moment, because mm -hmm. I'm clearly I can tell they are having a hard time. Yeah. But and it's making me nervous that they're nervous and we're not talking yeah. about it. And, and like I'm like, but then I'm like, this is gonna be okay. Like yeah. like we're good. We I we have as much time as you need. Like, we're gonna do this. And you know, the thing is, if you're nervous and somebody's not gonna react to you that way, and somebody's gonna be like, I don't have time for this nervous person. I'm like, like you dodged a bullet. That sounds like a horrible person to like work with or work for. <laughs> so like, if you can't be honest about like having a heart, like, oh, like I, I ate bad sushi yesterday, I'm sorry. Like just, <laughs> it happens. Like. Well, also, um, just, just to go back to after the pitch or the interview or whatever, don't forget to follow up. I, we're all so busy that if you're not fresh in our minds when you need to be, you're going to be forgotten. And that's just in anywhere. Like I've, I've had interviews recently where people just send me emails. I'm like, oh, I should talk to that person. Nine jobs later, 450 hours of work. And I'm like, I just forgot. And I go through old emails. I'm like, oh, I wish that person would have called me or emailed me. I've totally forgotten. I hired somebody else. Or I like to let people know when I got a job somewhere else. And just say, I had a fantastic time interviewing with you. Yeah. Or I remember you from two or three years ago. I'm now working in the same building. Do you want to grab lunch sometime? I just, I really remember you and thought you were kind of a cool person. And now that I work in the same building, let's hang out. Yeah, or just shooting an email like, oh, yeah. remember you from last year. And it's great to see you. What are you working on these days? Yeah. Stay personable. Stay in touch. Yeah. If you can, if you can make that personal connection, just staying in touch can be tremendous. I mean, because they can, oh yeah, dude, I got this sort of thing over here. Maybe you should talk to George. And I also highly recommend um, if you work in the entertainment industry, you'll notice that people move from one job to the other a lot. If there's anybody that you've ever had some success with in the past or that you hit it off with, um, usually I'll drop them like a little handwritten note. Like if they get a new job, like they're going to run development for a network or something. It's like, hey, just saw the, your announcement in Hollywood Reporter. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Blah, blah. Just stay in mind, but don't be again. Don't only get in touch with people when you have an ask, when mm. you have something that you need. Yeah. I, I just uh, finished some work on a, a big movie, and I was really proud to work on it. And um, just r right at the end, I got the director and everybody else these little gift baskets just so I'd stay fresh in their mind for the next one. Uh, just a little, you know, trying to sell myself just when they look at that bottle of scotch or something. Oh, yeah, Cully. So little things like that can help, too. Something memorable that they just have around. Like, oh, yeah, that, that guy got me that thing. Not that I'm saying give gifts to everybody. It just has to be in the right situation. But, uh, you know, I'm, ho I'm actually hoping that gets us on the, uh, the next one coming up. Yeah. Or, like... At least in their minds. I'm not saying I'm trying to buy the work. <laughs> we call that in, in advertising the leave behind, yeah. and that's actually a really that's a really really common thing. And sometimes you'll you'll if it's a really big company you'll call and you'll find out like what's the what's the policy. Cause sometimes you can't give things over a certain amount of money, and sometimes it's like ten bucks. So like you literally like need to know, and you'll um, create like custom leave behinds mm. that are for like the room of, of executives. It was just an honest. I really yeah. loved working with these yeah. people. They were at the top of their game. They were fantastic people, and I wanted to, you know, leave an impression one way or another. And I'm 
like I said, we'll see if that helped. <laughs> so uh, final question uh, before we open the mic up to questions. Any final words of advice for our students? Oh, tape yourself pitching and watch yourself. Yeah. Like that's totally one of those things like if you haven't done any like performing or have like been on stage, um, I mean, go to like an open mic and just watch people. Like it's terrifying. Um, get up there and terrify yourself if you're capable. Um, or just tape yourself and watch yourself or practice in a mirror. I mean, it, it sounds and it feels a little foolish, but it really is very helpful when you're trying to build that confidence. Um, even though I was like a super sloucher on camera in my mock interview, like I didn't have a ton, ton of confidence when I was a younger person. Um, and I wanted to meet with really big people. And that's, you know, and maybe I was more confident when I was like with my peers, but it's really, really intimidating when, um, when folks want to open doors for you or you get an opportunity, you want to be ready. And never let that happen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe on that, on that note, like pitching, your, you know, recording it, maybe even just to get confidence up uh, a karaoke bar. Karaoke, that's a great of, one. Yeah, yeah. Get up in front of, you know. Try Can I to tell you, do, does, I mean, do you guys watch a lot of TED Talks on YouTube? Um, just as far as speaking techniques, mm -hmm. watch some TED Talks and you'll see how people keep people engaged. And it usually starts with, you know, posing a question. Most of the pitches that I've seen pose a question. Most of the great stories that I know, um, like if, I'll use the example, like Sex in the City, like every single episode starts with Carrie Bradshaw positing a question. And then the rest of the episode is all about the response to whatever that question is. When you walk in and you say, like, what if you found out your mother-in-law was a criminal who was on the lam or something like that? And people are like, ooh, that's interesting. That's interesting because you and then they want to start hear, thinking And then they want to hear what it is yeah. you're talking about as opposed to, well, this story is about a guy who lives in New England. You now have something that has to be answered. So ask questions at the top of a pitch. Try to get people involved. It also invites them to have conversation with you because if somebody comes back and says, yes, my mother-in-law murdered six people. <laughs> then you can pitch one of the other two things that you brought in because you brought <laughs> pitches. Okay. Uh, do you want me to bring the mic down? Oh, you've got it. Okay. Please, don't be shy. You've got three Hall of Famers up here. Hello. Hi. Um, I got a question. I'm actually a master's student in film, and um, bye guys, thanks. <laughs> bye. Where is, Great where job. Is, um, where is the, where is the speaker? Can you hold your? Oh, hand? right here, yeah. right here. Oh, cool. Thank All right. you. Um, I'm a master's student in film, and uh, my name is Josh. By the way, it's very nice meeting you all. Hi, Josh. <laughs> um, I have a question about like a lot of people are passionate about certain characters that they create, and and then of course the story, and sometimes maybe the story could be bland, and the character could be like more of the story and sometimes you know when it comes down to it they may push the story rather than the character um is there something that can help out especially when the elevator pitch um that would help them like show them why they're passionate about that story being told even though it's similar and having that different kind of character to i always draw, i always draw a comparison to things that have worked in the past like when i when i come in and you find like if there's a really great character like if you're talking about I'm going to use this example of a thousand years old. Um, Jimmy Stewart in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington is just this guy who's so bent on doing good and da da da. If, you, if I went in and I pitched a movie where I have a character who is just so honest and has so much integrity that that's kind of like his push for the story, that that kind of it, it, it's focused about his change, I would I might go into a movie, but I might say like, did you ever see Jimmy Stewart in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington? like how he was so earnest that it just like totally ate him from the inside out. It was like, that always stuck with me in this character. Basically, this movie's about a character who's very similar. And that's all you need to do to kind of put somebody in that frame of understanding that the character is important to what's going on. Um, ultimately, what's important when you pitch something is going to be like, is it castable, is it makeable? They're all thinking, of, most people are thinking about it from a, a standpoint of like, is it a story that the person seems invested in? And when you say, I always loved these kind of movies, I always love this kind of thing. So this is kind of the same tone as this other thing. It also helps them really contextualize what you're bringing them very quickly. Um, so that'll help you as far as if you're trying to pitch something where the characters are super important. 
because the last thing a person wants in a pitch meeting is to hear about this laundry list of really interesting people that you've come up with. They want you to kind of set up the tone more so than the individual characters, and then they know how to frame everything you're talking about from that point forward because you're pitching them something that's a little bit similar to, to something they may already know about. Am I in the ballpark of an answer there? <laughs> Am I hovering over it like a giant smoggy hot dog? <laughs> smoggy hot dog? I can't, well, I just I can't see anyone's reactions to anything. Okay, I was just imagining That's someone sitting in the back just going, oh, no. That was, a, that was Another gold. Not him next That was gold. Year. Just gold. Smoggy hot dog. That's what Buck, Hello? Buck Henry Hello? calls smog is a hot dog over LA. Uh, hi, my name is Rob. Uh, I was just going to ask, are there some kind of uh, mannerisms or topics or things that you should try to avoid when you're pitching to someone that would make you like turned off or would you kind of go in the back of your head like, ew, like this person doesn't sound very, uh, like you'd want to work with them on anything. Are, are there little subtleties that maybe you could note that would just kind of in the back of your mind, you'd just be like, I don't, I don't really want to talk about this. Generalities or people telling me how much money I'm going like to make? Like politics or, or yeah. Um, oh yeah, never talk politics. Yeah. <laughs> well, unless you know that other person's politics that's true. really well. That's true. Like, hey, I was just I saw you at that Al Franken fundraiser. That's so weird that you're here. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that one time? Yeah. Um, I you know, I think don't don't assume like with that, but like I get that sometimes where someone will like I will have people assume things of me because you know, they'll see my art or they'll see my work and they'll be like, Well, she's kinda of like a funky leftist kind of kooky lady um but i'm probably more conservative than you think maybe i, I mean not like in like a creepy like republican wizard way but like <laughs> i mean maybe <laughs> like just in like a i don't know in like a fiscal maybe censored way mm -hmm. you know like with how i i view um you know some of my behaviors as i've gotten older especially and you know, make myself more as like a humanist and a universalist than necessarily like a feminist. Like that's definitely one where they'll be like, right, Kim, and like all the women should be in charge. And I'll be like, the best person should be in charge. Um, so I, I think it's nice to not assume things of, of folks. And um, I mean, don't be gross is always a good lesson too. You know, if you, if you smoke, is good. and I was a smoker for a long time. And I think if you like, that's a good thing to just kind of say too. like, even while I was, I wouldn't before I would go and meet with people you know, like it's just one of those things. Like if you're, don't be gross. Like don't smell. Um, you know, if you're a guy that wears a hat, like wear your hat because otherwise your hair might look weird. We have clean nails. Like just really basic stuff that like sometimes we forget because um, we're so concerned with what we're going to talk about. I'm so self-conscious about everything about me in this exact moment sitting next to you. Are you right? <laughs> I'm feeling <laughs> the ends of my fingers. Like I cut my nails before okay. I came. I, on the I personally have a problem with anybody coming to see me that are in flip-flops or sandals for you the first toast. time. That's what I mean. Like people I, have that. I, I have man feet issues. Like yeah. do not come to me in. in no I mean, mandals. if you're a woman, I get it. You take care of your feet. You have open-toed shoes, whatever. But if you're a man and you're coming in with sandals, I don't know. It's just me. oh man, and it's just people? I would I would be like okay, all those you're nudists. Out the door. Right. Put some pants on before you meet. That's right. <laughs> but that's that's the individual. I mean, a lot of people in California be like, dude, nice sandals. Yeah. Yeah. So. And like relative cleanliness, like just not. You don't have right. to be like crazy, but. I would just, you know, go slow, <laughs> wear sandals later if you get the job. Yeah. See if it works out. <laughs> oh, I think we have. And don't wear polyester if you have to walk to an interview. Why? What does that do? Because, like Liza Minnelli, I sweat from the head first. Okay. And you, uh, you'll be a mess when you show up. Okay. If your clothes don't breathe. Oh, I didn't. Yeah. I don't wear a lot of Oh, we have a <laughs> question over here. Yeah, we have an online question from the YouTube streaming. Fantastic. Um, okay, so this one's from Carrie Bell. Um, hey, she Carrie. wants to know, uh, if you have less than 60 seconds with a potential client, what would you guys suggest to focus on first? Um, she really wants to know, like, the top three things you would need to get out or the top three things to avoid. Um, basically, what are the, uh, the lines of what they are... Um, wanting to hear right out of the gate. What are you guys are wanting to hear right out of the gate? Uh, I, can I, I'll jump in. Because I get, I get into that kind forward. of stuff all the time. Um, for me, with a client, I would say, I'm really interested in talking about your business problems. I think we can figure out some really creative ways to do some work together. Um, and I think you know, with that kind of sentence, I'm leaving it open to like, 
I care about what's going wrong with your business, and I think that we can find a way to work together. And I put the word creative in there because I'm not going to help facilitate anything not creative. <laughs> so that also like just kind of like peppers and like, well, this is what I do. Um, and that's enough to get them interested, you know? Yeah, that's a great answer. I, I usually, when I'm doing something or pitching something, I, I phrase it in such a way that my value as a participant in whatever's happening is important. Which, if I'm doing, if I was pitching a game show, I'd say, look, you know, I've been working on game shows for a while. This is what I've always liked about your content. They know just from that, I've done this before and I'm familiar with their work, which kind of gets all of that out of the way. Again, it's that establishing a familiarity as soon as you can. Um, and it's what Kim says is really important as far as like caring about what they're what position they're in. You're, you, if you're pitching something that's yours to that other person and you've only got 60 seconds, it's gotta be, I know exactly what kind of content you've done before. I'm familiar with your brand, I know who you are. I'm not trying to bring a romantic comedy to Martin Scorsese, um, that you care enough about their time to respect it and you're not just sort of carpet bombing people at random with your desire to make X, Y, or Z. I'm Good. kind of not applicable. <laughs> yeah. We covered it I'm usually selling explosions. And, uh, they're easily sale. <laughs> um, hi. Okay, so you guys mentioned having confidence in your um, elevator pitch, but how much confidence is too much confidence? Like, um. I feel like Tro Troy nailed that a little bit. Like when people are they're trying they're selling you on something that's like clearly not real. You know, I don't think that if you're if you're being humble and honest, you kind of can't be you can't be like too confident if you're being like super honest. Right. Um, there's, there's a, a cocky line. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. yeah. Just, well, I'm being able if, to. If you're being honest, yeah. If, if you're being honest in, uh, about the material and and uh, you don't go overboard, like what was the other, honest and. Humble. Humble. Honest yeah. and humble. If you can combine that with your confidence, you won't get to the cocky point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think that's one of those things that, like, you kind of just have to have to have, you know. And if it's if you're worried, like, I might be too confident, then uh, I would say just let the other person talk more. Yeah. You know, if it's you can't be too confident in some like small doses. You know, so if you if you choose to like say just a little bit with confidence, if you're like, I don't want to be you know too much of a cocky person, be like, yeah, I'm really liking it, and like just let them speak. Like <laughs> that way, you kind of can figure out your balance. Pause um, for effect. Yeah, yeah. pause <laughs> for effect. Yeah. Um, again, it's just I I say talk about the the line between confidence and bravado. Uh, the, like like I said earlier, it's just it's you don't talk about how much money you're going to make for somebody else. You don't come in saying. You know, action movies are very popular. It's like, no kidding. No, <laughs> no, Sherlock, that's what I've been making for 15 years. Um, also, I find that people that have a lot of bravado are also not paying attention to the opportunity to be asked a question about their product. Um, if I open my mouth more than twice in a meeting, like I go, like I'm, start, like I'm starting to indicate to you that I'd like to ask you a question about your project and you're still just barfing this <laughs> list of characters and their special traits and how you did this and it's going to turn me off because it's just sort of like I know you're excited about it, but like I ultimately would be the person who has to say yes and move forward. I want to ask you questions. I don't might not be information that I need from you right now. So pay attention to what's happening with the other person. Um, I think the ultimate sign of confidence is not feeling like you have such a closed window of opportunity that a conversation will interrupt you being able to sell something. Uh, okay. It's uh, another YouTube streaming question for Ash or from Ashley Brooks. Um, have you ever pitched to a music artist or the music industry in general? And if so, how did it come about and what happened? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. I don't know how I want to answer that question. Um, I've done some, uh, some music video work and I've done some live, uh, live video stuff um, for musicians. Um, I think that's different because you're working with talent, so their brand is very personal, mm -hmm. and there's um, a different sensitivity that they have to how you're going to kind of navigate their project than necessarily a brand. Because, you know, when you're if you're talking to like 
you know, Quaker, you're not talking to like Mr. Quaker who started the company. <laughs> so people are invested, but they're not like as invested. Like when you have a musician, like that's them. That's their face. Like that's their thoughts. Like that's them. Um, and I've had some projects where they've gone really well and I've been, you know, like I've said, this is what we're going to do. This is what it costs. Um, I believe in it. Let's do it. And we were off to the races and it was an um, amazing experience. And I've had some that have just been tangled nightmares um, that was, you know, probably some on my part and some on their part. And just you have to you have to figure out how to navigate the sensitivity of something that's so art focused when there's when it's a musician um, in particular. I found that the, the more experienced they are, the more forgiving they are, to tell you the truth, mm -hmm. because they're more comfortable with somebody interpreting their their work instead of somebody that's just starting out they're very close to it mm -hmm. so pitching a music video idea um, it, it becomes difficult because they're really attached to it and their your vision uh, is totally different from what they may have seen so they either pitch you and sell you on their idea or you try to give them your idea and go from there um, so yes yeah, it's, it's it's a tricky one with music like so I've been told that that's all the time we have today. Uh, but thank you so much for attending. And please uh, join me in thanking Kim, Cully, and Troy for their time. Thank you.